Oh, we're getting ready to go. Our next brew. All right. Becky. Thank you, God, for creating it. <laughs> Once again, if you leave an apple on the ground after it drops, it will turn to cider. This one is going to be platforms. Becky, and it, it is a raspberry apple cider. Giving thanks to it, Mike. <laughs> there you go. Got to be thankful. Every sip. Ooh, I like ooh, the color got already. The, ooh, the nice oh raspberry color. Oh, that is cool. Oh, nice. That yep. is cool. Ooh, it's smelling good, too. This is more up my alley. I can smell that raspberry <laughs> coming right off there. Yeah, it smells better. You already take, you already... I did. I already took a sip. You can <laughs> smell that raspberry coming right off that. Mmm, nice. This is nice. This is the blueberry, by the way. Blueberry or raspberry? Definitely less tart. Mike, yeah. if you want to okay. find our... Gotcha, yeah. We got did you the... say blueberry or raspberry? This is the blueberry. A blueberry. Also 6%. A plateau slightly different at 13%. Nice. Sweet. Not sure what plateau is, though, honestly. Just go with it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. It's plateau. <laughs> also well, English it's... cider version of yeast. And the Heritage Blend Apple Juice, same as the former. Oh, this is much nicer. Less tart. <laughs> I like much tart. More, this is a fruity. This is much more fruity. Oh, my Lord. That smells like a bushel of uh, berries. Oh, my Lord. Yeah. I, I haven't even tried it yet. The color is awesome. It's this beautiful bluish amber. Mm -hmm. Oh, my Lord. That looks cool. No foam. The smell is amazing. I haven't even tasted it yet. The smell is amazing. You're I gonna have like, an orchard blow up in I, your uh, in your mouth. Yeah, I feel like I'm in a blueberry patch. This is amazing. It's definitely this a lot less tart. Oh wow, Perfect. that's smooth. Would you like one? But you would like this. That is smooth. I like it out of the can. I would. I, I'm not sure why I want to eat like pancakes with it. Right? <laughs> you would right? I could yeah. totally eat pancakes. No, it wouldn't would. go well with pancakes. But I could eat. totally do yeah. pancakes with this. Not that I condone well, pancakes. <laughs> that is so good. Gluten free. Gluten free mm. pancakes. Okay. Mm. Wow. I endorse this. <laughs> yeah, I do like this. I'm, I'm not a cider guy, but I would drink more than one of this one. Yeah. 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 And, my, and I do like tarts, but this one is just smooth. And it's 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 not sweet. I don't want to say that. It's, no, right. it's not. Definitely it, not. It has the full blueberry smell to it, like you're actually walking around in a blueberry patch. It does have a slight tart in it, not as tart as the last one. Right, but it's slight. It's very slight. And it's 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 got smooth, mm -hmm. but it has that beautiful blueberry overtone to it. Yeah. So. There's no initial bite at all. I'm expecting mm -hmm. one, but. Every time I sip it, there isn't. You know what this would be really good with, too? Is making like a, um, mixing this with like a, a, in a vinaigrette. Oh. With a, um, uh, with, with a nice harvest type salad, like with a sweet potato and, uh. I can see that. Uh, Pancake kind of, oh, what? Well, <laughs> uh, kind of like more like root vegetables and things like that. Mm -hmm. So mixed in with that, with with uh, mixed in is like a vinaigrette. It would oh that would just be that would be over the top that and healthy <laughs> and that good. Is Chef Steve and, over there. Yeah, Chef Steve is thinking ahead it's here. It's coming out. <laughs> Apparently, from the Science Channel, there are more than one forms of alcohol. So, but it's not on the periodic table. I've confirmed, <laughs> and it's a carbon-based life form of c 2 h 5 oh So a little All bit right. of carbon, oxygen, hydrogen going there. So. I am so glad that you so could have a little bit of help. Thank you, <laughs> Mike. Yes, yes. Yeah. Figured he All right. did. But is, so Dr. Mike has cleared this up for us. <laughs> now, I will say this. So I pulled an article from I, uh, I don't know what it was again. It was from GCI. I'll link it. It's a really good article. But I'm going to pop up to the top, and we'll take it in segments because I partitioned it into segments because it covers a variety of topics within it. So we're going to start at the top and work our way down. One of the first mentions of wine in Scripture is by Melchizedek, 
priest of the Most High God at Salem, later called Jerusalem, during the time of Abram, whose name was later changed to Abraham. Melchizedek brought forth bread and wine for Abram and his companions. The Hebrew word translated wine in Genesis is yayin. This, is, this word is used over 130 times in the Hebrew Bible. For those who don't understand Hebrew Bible, that just means Old Testament. Old Testament is Hebrew Bible. Whether you regard the Old Testament as Protestant or whatever, it's the Hebrew Bible, Old Testament. Does that include your Schofield? For <laughs> no, unfortunately. They excluded Yayan. Anyway, <laughs> not grape juice. This the same beverage, when used excessively, causes drunkenness. It says that Noah drank too much Yayin. Remember Yayin. This is going to come into play later. Okay, Yayin and became drunk. Lot also became drunk on this beverage, and so did Nabal. Nevertheless, God told his people to enjoy Yayin at the yearly festivals. Wait, what? Wait, wait, wait. I have to stop the article right there. God said do what? To enjoy it. Deuteronomy 14.26. What does that say? How is that allowable? Well, the Old Testament's pretty scandalous. <laughs> <laughs> well, they had refrigeration back then. That's right, that's right. They just called out Frigidaire. Well, they saved the ice blocks from the winter. Oh, of course. <laughs> what was I thinking? <laughs> uh, in addition to using wine as a beverage, God also commented the Levitical priest to include in the sacrificial, por uh, sacrificial portions a portion of wine, yayin, as a drink offering. These scriptures make it clear that there can be a right and a wrong use of wine. Mm. So right there in those passages, you have both good and bad, right and wrong ways to use yayin. Good use, bad use. Now, is yayin, is that Hebrew? It is. Okay. It is. Uh, once you get to the New Testament, of course, it's written in Greek, so it'd be onyos. So onyos would be the Greek, and yayin is the Hebrew. So is it Manischewitz or was it Mogan David? <laughs> Shivitz came later. <laughs> <laughs> but we will actually cover that a little bit. It's pretty interesting. We will cover that a little bit, not in its you know, proper terminology, but we will cover that a little bit. Uh, under proper usage, naturally fermented wine is between 10 and 14% alcohol. Higher alcoholic wines are fortified wines. On special occasions, God even allowed use of what is translated as strong drink. This term comes from a different Hebrew word, sheka, which is used 22 times in the Old Testament and refers to alcoholic beverages and drinks made from dates and other fruit. Higher sugar content. Exactly, which caused a higher... The alcohol content. That is correct. And they're drinking moonshine in the Old Testament. 10 14%. It gets pretty close. It's pretty, wow. Well, and most uh, modern wines, right. believe it or not, between no. 10 and 14%. So wow. wine is actually higher in alcohol than beer. So, oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, so most of your wines are between 10 and 14%. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm making a joke. That was the Old Testament moonshine. <laughs> it gets even better. We'll get to that. The high alcohol drinks called hard liquor today. 40% to 50% alcohol, or 80 to 100 proof, did not exist in biblical times. They are produced by distilling grain-based mash or material from other sources. They did not come into widespread use until the Middle Ages. The danger of these high alcoholic drinks is that unless one dilutes them, they easily lend themselves to abuse, drunkenness, and alcoholism. Liqueurs, flavored and sweetened distilled liquors, are somewhat different in what they are usually served in small amounts and sipped slowly. And that's true. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Does anybody enjoy liqueurs? No. You sure. savages. Sure. <laughs> you <laughs> savages. Enjoy well, what? Liqueurs. Chambord oh, would yeah. be one. Okay. Yes. Uh, Thank you. And yeah, Chambord is one. Uh, there's, yep, there's some, they're very sweet. Uh, 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 they're, they're, used, they're really called basically dessert 
dessert drinks. liquors, yes. Uh, they come in a very small glass. You just sip them. You don't guzzle them. Oh, my Lord. Steve, you are civilized. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's true. Uh, liquors and liqueurs are two completely different things. So liquors are usually used to make, like you say, mixed drinks or do shots. Well, okay. you get your whiskeys, your bourbons, your... Yeah, there's a, pl vodka a plethora, right? Plethora yeah. <laughs> that that is, is done through a, a distilled process okay. of taking either potatoes or grain or something and right. making a mash. To based on to based on whatever your yeah. your your source is, right? Yes. You know, whether it's grains or whether it's different mashes or whether yeah. So correct, yeah. So that's your liquors. Liqueurs are actually infused into different uh, sweeteners mm -hmm. or juices or liqueurs are normally a little lower in alcohol content compared to liquors but they are made to be enjoyed sipped slowly often either with a meal or a dessert well, they they're are very high intensity flavors oh yeah they're very highly concentrated so you're that's why it, a little gives you a lot of goes a long way right think about like kalua's kalua's yeah kalua's good one. one yeah okay uh look uh kalua even believe it or not even like a jagermeister yeah so, no. mm -hmm. so yeah, i do enjoy those especially like in coffee no, oh right. man ba yeah. uh, like a bailey's, bailey's or a ryan's is yeah. fantastic in coffee yeah right. so i mean so i, I mean, don't i don't condone it i just enjoy it <laughs> 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 yeah, so so your your Kahluas are not quite as high in alcohol eh, alcohol content. They're not, yeah. But they're not meant to be very high in alcohol. No. They're meant to be enjoyed. Right. So they are a little different than your liquors. Nevertheless, it still gets you banned in some churches. <laughs> it's neither here nor there. Poor John the Baptist. <laughs> <laughs> the Bible says that God gave wine to make men glad. Psalm 104.15. Why have some people turned this blessing of God into a curse? The answer is that many people do not follow God's instructions. Oh, my Lord. They are calling Christians out in this article for being too restrictive. Mm. What's the source of this article? We will get to that. I'll, I'll actually post a link to this. It's okay. actually from GCI. Uh, I think it's Grace Community International. So... Um, but they, they give good biblical examples, which is why I like this article. Mm -hmm. They give good biblical examples. It, it, they, they did their research. And, and we'll be pulling from actual, actual biblical encyclopedias later. So, number four, I think. Um, a blessing of wine was prophesied as a heritage to the jet. Uh, chosen people in, Jer in Genesis 27, 28. May God give you heaven's dew and earth's richness and abundance of grain and new wine, tirash. We'll get to tirash in a bit. The Hebrew word tirash, meaning new wine, is used in 30... Okay, actually this slide is sooner than I thought. <laughs> used in 38 places in the Old Testament. People sometimes concluded that this word means grape juice or fresh pressed juice of the wine. No? no? <laughs> However, Hosea 4.11 states, Old wine, yayin, and new wine, tirash, take away their understanding. Hmm. Grape juice could not have this effect. Tirash is an intoxicating wine if used in excess. So new wine, Tirash, is alcoholic. That takes away any possible misconcluding remarks made by pastors and teachers across the United States. Right, 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 right. <laughs> Including a lot of my uh, assembly friends and family. That's right. And it took Jose to do it. Did you say Jose? Hosea. Oh, yeah. Hosea. Well, I mean, okay. even, but, but even... <laughs> With an H, Gumby. Hosea 4, <laughs> Jose, Jose 4 11. <laughs> Even also, as we look at our... As we look at this, especially the Old Testament, and uh, as we go through, as we look at, at, at... One of the big things that we really try to concentrate in doing is putting the Bible in the context at which it was written. Yeah. Which is really important. So we have to look at, at the period of time then. 
So there was no refrigeration back then. There was no preservatives, things like that. So, so actually the alcohol, the process of, of making the alcohol is actually became the preservative mm -hmm. of it. So to realize that, that, that if, you know, fresh pressed grape juice, if you were to press, I mean, what you would do anyways in order to make the process anyways, you'd squeeze the grapes and get the juice out of it. But it would not take a very long time for that fermentation to begin, probably right. within several hours. Right. So to clearly say that, like, okay, you just, what, squeeze grapes and then serve the, the communion, you know, and it's like, or, or, the, or, or have the sacrificial wine, like, right there. No, it, 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 it fermented. And, and we have to clearly understand it. It's not meant to, it wasn't there to make so we can all just be gluttons or whatever with it. But Yeah. It was just kind of, it, it was cultural. It was cultural. Yeah. And even in Europe today, it's cultural. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I always got this impression of the caveman just sort of like le acts forgetting grapes on the table and coming back and being so hungry, eating these grapes that had accidentally fermented and discovering alcohol. Like, whoa, all of a sudden my heart is happy. Right. <laughs> you Thank <know>? you, God. <laughs> Maybe they did. <laughs> Let's do that again. Don't eat grapes for five days left on the table. <laughs> but even actually in like today's terms, because I, I interact with a lot of missionaries, people who serve in other areas of the world and, and very, you know, different places and... and they live very spirit-controlled lives, and, and, you know, alcoholism is not, I mean, not alcoholism, but alcohol itself is not regularly in their diet. However, they are put in positions in, in, in their, as missionaries and where they're serving, whereby they interact with folks, and, and there are a lot of uh, uh, fermented alcoholic drinks that are, that are customs, Mm -hmm. that are part of different cultures uh, like Mongolia they do what's called fermented yak milk and this stuff you know it's pretty potent you know and uh, one of the customs is that if you, if you have guests you give some you give them a, a, a drink of this fermented yak milk absolutely and so there's cheese. not cheese not cheese no not cheese, <laughs> no, not cheese. this is like and I guess it, it it's pretty nasty for my yes. kid. Too, so. <laughs> Sounds wonderful. So, uh, you know, so but based on it, but, but in order not to be offensive to the person who's invited them, they drink it, you know, okay. and, and they clearly say, like, whoa, this stuff's like, it was pretty powerful. You know, they don't make <laughs> regular diets of it, but it's a custom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, even their missionary friends they have there in Europe, you know, it's, it's not uncommon to meet some, you know, to meet people and, and they have wine. You know, it, as part of the dinner, you know? Yeah. Right. And culturally, it's not as much a stigma as it is over here. This is, yeah, that's true. That's true. Well, I, I sometimes wonder if, if alcohol is even really the subject. I mean, those who tend to abuse alcohol, alcohol is just a symptom that they choose to correct something within themselves in Correct. the past. It, it, you know, it could be medicine. It could be whatever. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes people with coffee, guilty. <laughs> I um, love coffee. But yeah, I mean to just focus on the fact that it's. Sometimes you know, that we it's just, just need alcohol. that just to function. <laughs> yeah. uh, coffee. I think Agreed. It, for those who who abuse certain things like that, it, it's a symptom of something deeper going on within yes. them spiritually that needs to be addressed. And when those things get addressed, you know that they, they may desire. Well, I, I don't want alcohol. Maybe. I don't even like it now, or maybe they can have moderation now, mm -hmm. you know, and operate I'm a great and operate with boundaries. I mean, I, I was I I've been the extreme. I I I am. I mean, I was an alcoholic. I'm not an alcoholic now, but I didn't know when to stop. I just drank until I was obliterated. Mm. Right. And you know, and that's just abusive. And what I realized was that that I didn't believe in myself. I, so I, I, I believe a, a lie that like, okay, if I could just pretend and be this or allow this to take me to a different state then also to become somebody who I'm not and to realize that, that as I started, as I started yielding myself to God 
you know, over many years, and to realize that, that that who I am in Christ is what I'm really about. And also now, even as an older gentleman, I mean, I have, I don't have a desire to go out and mask myself with with alcohol or food or whatever it is. But I've come to a point to realize that that who God has created me and made me in in Himself is 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 so deep and so important now to realize that I'm I'm like even ten years ago I, I, I wouldn't be talking like I am talking now. And I wouldn't have the confidence that I have now that God has given me and the platform that He's given me by, by yielding myself into Him. And it's really not me at all, but it's just it's Him working through me. Right. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Good. That's good, Steve. Love that you said platform, too. <laughs> <laughs> now, we know that Jesus' first miracle, right? Oh, yeah. I forgot yeah. about that. What so, was it? In the same article, it states, Jesus' first miracle was to change water into wine. Onios. I brought that up earlier, right? Onios is the Greek equivalent to yayin. Mm. Some people who preach total abstinence claim that this miracle was to turn water into grape juice. Imagine if you can a Jewish wedding banquet where everyone drank only grape juice. The ancients did not have refrigeration or any other method of preventing grape juice from fermenting. On this occasion, Christ turned six jars of 20 or 30 gallons each into wine, onios. This was no small miracle. This wine was of the highest, finest quality. You saved the best till now. At a wedding feast, the host normally started with the best wine, and they would bring out lesser quality wines later. That was the 1953 Bordeaux. My man, Jesus. <laughs> That's $800 a bottle. first ever bootlegger. <laughs> Conti- continued. <laughs> and so, can you imagine how quickly it happened? It, it wasn't like the grapes just fell down and waited a few days. This was right. that. Uh, it was out of water. They didn't even use grapes. Yeah. Right. So we don't know if it was white or red wine. Oh. Ooh. Oh, touche. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't what? thought of that. Maybe it was a rosé. Best of both worlds? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was leaning water Shira. is clear. A Shira. Wine. I do like a good Shira. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Uh, Jesus gave a parable involving the fermenting process of onios, Matthew 9, 17. At that time, instead of having metal or glass bottles to enclose wine, the skins of animals were used. The fermentation of the wine could burst an old skin, but it would not break a new stretchable skin. Another proof that onios is fermented wine is the fact that the Apostle Paul said, Do not get drunk on wine, onios, Paul did not mean to avoid getting drunk on grape juice. Paul instructed Timothy, stop drinking only water and use a little wine, onios, because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. He said to use only a little wine, not a whole lot. The purpose of this wine was Timothy's frequent stomach ailments. Small amounts of wine can help stomach problems. And probably the water was not as healthy as the wine either. Right. Because of they didn't have purification and things like we have today and right. with and, water. And, and yeah. that's a good that's point. True. And that's a good point. And that is brought up inside some of my slides coming up. It's during their their time in in their era, right? The the early Roman Jewish era, they had to find a way to, to purify the water. Okay? Because you have how many numerous ailments across water between different you know, worms and viruses. Well, you also have to realize, too, that if you have streams of water, right? that when people habitate nearby them, they also put things in that water. Yeah. Because it becomes your sewage system. Well, yeah. And and, and the, so where the, where you're getting the water from was very important, and where you did your things was very important, yeah. too. So, <laughs> agreed, so, agreed. Which is true. But but even the Romans, in their, as we look back at history, they're... Um, utmost creativity they had by uh, by doing those uh, those raised uh, water um, aqueducts. aqueducts that they built were genius where, which is genius where they were using the smelted snow the melted snow caps from the from the, uh, the the mountains from the Alps and it was as it melted it, it yeah, so it was very genius to do that but that was 
like around Jesus era, right? You think the years and years before that 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 never existed. Yeah, that's correct. I I, I agree. It's interesting. Hey, um, look, my my onios at home. It works better than Lunesta to help me go to sleep. I'm just gonna be honest. One glass, one glass of red wine, or depending, sometimes white wines, depending on the alcohol. I fully agree on that because just one glass. I uh, okay. So, as my wife knows, I'm an I'm an insomniac. Kendra, indeed. That's my wife in the background. So, I am quite the insomniac. I uh, I come and sleep three to five hours a night. Uh, my average is three to five hours a night. I have, find it hard to sleep more than that. Um, uh, say what you want. <laughs> I, it's been my, my life since I was at least 12 years old. I don't remember what it was before that. Um, and so sleeping for me is often a problem. At least getting to sleep is often a problem. Mm. And I will often have a glass of wine to get me to sleep. And it does not take more than a glass of wine. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Once it's later in the, in the end of the night, it just starts that process that gets me to bed. Yeah. And I'm not drinking like five glasses of wine. It's usually a glass of wine. Right. And it's enough to calm my ner- you know, I don't, I won't say I don't want to say nerves because I'm not a nervous person, but I'm an active person. And so it, it's enough to stop me from moving around and one glass will calm me down enough to where I can sit down and then start the process where I actually fall asleep. Yep. But it's not like we're condoning if there's a root problem why you can't sleep. <laughs> Don't turn to wine. There could be a medical reason for this, too. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just, See your doctor. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm highly ADHD, and so I don't like to sleep. I like to be up and, and moving and running around and researching and reading and yeah, yeah. I enjoy that. I like that and I feel like I'm missing out when I don't. When, when I'm so, Aaron, it, you would it, say your 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 your, your propensity of, of how you are is that your kind of guy is like squirrel, 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 squirrel. <laughs> so you're, uh, you're you're always looking for things and and you're you're looking around and everything around you and you're reacting to a lot of things. So you're very high strong. Don't ask me, it's my wife. Well, I mean, but, <laughs> but the thing is to realize, I mean, it's, I'm not saying it funny, but it is funny, though. But uh, <laughs> uh, but to realize, though, that, that, that what also is you realize is you, as you sit down, you're relaxing. Yes. You're, 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 you're enjoying something, you're sipping, you're not, if, like, you're not like taking the bottle and guzzling. No, 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 You know, glass of wine. No, 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 no. But, but that's what I'm saying. But you're, <laughs> you're, 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 you have a, a small glass, you're sipping, and you're, con- yeah. you're, 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 you're coming to a point in, in your time of the day where you're relaxing. Well, like, like this week, for example, one bottle of Shiraz is going to be through the entire week. And, like, literally half a glass of wine is knocking me out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not like I, like last night. I, I sat there and I, I maybe got through five sips, and it got me to the point where it just stopped me, and I sat down, and I was out. Like li- like literally, I woke up at like th- th- like three in the morning, and I moved myself to my bedroom. I was out, <laughs> like 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 three to five sips, and I was gone. That's good stuff, man. Uh, well, it, it, it's not even that. Oh, you. <laughs> Yeah, it's not even that strong. It's just the fact that it stopped me and made me stop from going here and there and there and there and there and there and there. Research this, research that, research this. Oh, back to work emails, back to work emails. Oh, over here. It stopped me, put me in the moment. Hmm. I sat down and I just fell asleep. And it only took like three or probably five sips, probably five sips. I think I got through maybe half the glass. He woke up Maybe. and the glass was just spilled in his lap. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, no, 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 I, no, 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 I said no, 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 not from them, but just, like, like, it just, it, like I said, I, I don't think I go through more than max, like, maybe a glass a night. That's it. Yeah. And I don't usually make it through the whole glass. <laughs> that, that is really fascinating. So you, but our, so I'm wondering if our motivations are different because you have to take that, that glass of wine to get you to that point. Not necessarily. I, mean, I take the glass of wine because I really enjoy sleeping. I, yeah. I, man, sometimes I'm like, man, I cannot <laughs> wait to get my butt to bed. 
See, I don't like sleep. And I just said but because I didn't want to say another word. But I, I can't wait for the rest to come. Right, right. And you're thinking, like, I could get so much done. Yes! In that six to seven hours. Yes! <laughs> yeah. I love... I love, I have so many special projects between working on my, <laughs> on my Muay Thai and working on, on, cause the and, and, and then answering, <laughs> answering all the emails. I get a lot of, oh my Lord, I'm a supervisor now. So on my daytime job, so I get a lot of email and that leads me and I can't, I mean, I oversee like most, like, like half of Northeast Ohio. So it's like, I get all those emails in from everywhere in every department and so i have all those emails coming in but then i also have like like things like the podcast you know so i have all these different i have i have, I have like five to twelve subjects i'm trying to tackle a night which keep me up all night but <laughs> if i have that half a glass of wine it stops me in the moment mm. and because it stops me inside the moment all of a sudden I realize there's this thing called sleep that will make me live longer. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And make so you perform better tomorrow. Recharges. Right? So I purposely will stop. If I am not tired by midnight, and I'm usually not, I will stop and have at least a half a glass of wine because it will make me go to sleep. <laughs> yeah. It's actually responsible. <laughs> I, wow. <laughs> Again, we're not condoning that. <laughs> Just saying it is. <laughs> right. Check with your physician before well, you make any decisions. More healthy than, uh, <laughs> it's probably more healthy than a barbiturate. And yes. Che- and cheaper Seriously. than a prescription to Lunesta. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely that. <laughs> right. Though I like their commercials. <laughs> <laughs> And there are, you know, 50,000, you know, warnings afterward. Right. <laughs> Do not take if you have, you know, like <laughs> everything that most Americans have. Yeah, right. This yeah. film will cause I love, anal seepage. I love those. <laughs> and if you <laughs> mind oily residues whenever you get up, I'm like, everybody minds that. Who wouldn't right. mind that? <laughs> I, I love the warnings. I love the warnings. Don't take this if you are depressed or if you are losing hair or think you might lose your eyesight. Thirty percent of Americans, right there. Keep going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's I will say, choose your wine carefully if you're going to use it like that. <clears throat> yes, yeah. high That's in nitrate could be high in nitrates and things like that. So that is true. That is true. Yeah. yeah. For the most part, like our beers, I am more and more trying to choose locally grown wines. Mm. Um, although, so far, my favorite Shiraz are still Australian. So, <laughs> I've yet to find a Shira, and, and mind you, I'm sure I will, but I've yet to find a Shira here in Ohio that is the equivalent of the Australians, mm. because the Australians have mastered the Shira. <laughs> the climate Should is perfect for it. Pose that challenge to the new uh, vineyard over on uh, Fult- Ooh, Memphis. There you go. There you go. Back to the text. <laughs> uh, Paul's warning. So, some of the Corinthians, Christians, were getting drunk at the Lord's Supper. They were using fermented wine, probably following the example that Paul had set for them. Paul did not tell them that they were using the wrong kind of wine. He simply told them to eat and drink at home and to participate in the Lord's Supper in a respectful way. Paul says... It is not good to drink wine or eat meat if it offends a weak brother. He is referring to fermented wine. Grape juice wouldn't offend anyone. (laughs) The implication is that there is nothing wrong with the wine in itself, only if it offends a weaker brother. Now, mind you, go back to that text. It is not just saying wine. What else did it say? Meat. Meat. Yeah, meat. That's true. Because even in that time, there were these things that Carr called vegetarians. So if that offends someone, too. all right. But dealing with just a wine, part. okay. <laughs> so when you say a weaker brother, right? This beer I'm drinking is six percent. Correct. Let's say you can only handle four percent. So do I only drink four percent? Is that what you mean by weaker, or do we mean like, oh wait, no <laughs> beer at all? <laughs> well, Gumby. When you're doing a squat, can you lift 600 pounds? Exactly. I mean, that's exactly my point. 
<laughs> I mean, I, I don't know how we exactly translate that. So, so I think probably, um, let's, let's kind of put it in context of the scriptures that we're saying right here. So what happened was they, uh, they had, they served the fermented wine as the, off, as the offering as, as part of communion as we know it today. Correct. So they had it in some form of vessel that the, it was distributed in either a cup or something. So what maybe they were doing is they were uh, filling the thing like full and just guzzling it. Correct. You know, and, and then becoming intoxicated from it. You know, yes. to a form where you're losing control and it turned into, you know, just to, to lasciviousness and things like that craziness. And so really, taken under that context, it's really not with the respect and honor to the Lord, but whereas we, so like we use a little small cup in our communion. You know, we, of course, we use grape juice, obviously, but, but even in the, uh, the Catholic Church and the, uh, and the Lutherans, which actually do use wine, it's not a large vessel. It's a very small cup. It's a taste. It just, it just barely wets your whistle. Don't abuse that grape juice, Steve. Yes, I understand. <laughs> but what happens is that it's out of remembrance and out of, out of worship to what God did for us. Yeah, yeah. And, and then when we get to that point where we just drink it to the point where we just lose control... And all of a sudden it becomes something that it's not. Right, right. And I think that's what Paul is probably speaking about here. Well, to realize even like the meat, so all of a sudden it turned into a big party, basically, was what it turned into. Well, I, I guess Maybe. what I'm asking, it seems like they had some conception of some things that were stronger in drink, Correct. quote unquote, than others. Correct. So that's why I was asking that. It's yeah. like, oh, you know what? That might be a little bit too much for you there, big guy. Why don't you, why don't you try some of this? Right. You know what I mean? And, like, and you'll still get some alcohol, but maybe I'm reading way too much into it. Then. I think you are. I thought you were being silly, but I actually think you're right. So if yeah, we should, <laughs> we should probably say, because in American society, we would say, I can handle six shots without even feeling anything and be braggadocious about it yeah i couldn't drive home and i feel like you know what you're saying whether you're serious or not seriously we should scale it back to the weakest link you know but i think what they meant in my opinion would be alcoholism it was prevalent and existed you know then too so i didn't mean it like that mike i didn't mean it like that (laughs) well did they Aaron? did they have i mean it, it seems like they had some real uh awareness of some things that were stronger in content than well, others. Correct. Let's go into ancient Israel and wine making. Mm. People drank copious amounts of wine because it was safer than water. Wine was also used as a disinfectant for wounds, as a dyeing agent, as an aid for digestion, and for religious ritual. The people knew something about winemaking in those days. The wine press was used close to the vineyard because there was less wastage of a greater opportunity to maintain control of the winemaking process. The whole family would be involved with the harvest. Grapes would be carried in baskets and laid on the floor of the wine press. And, and the men feet. usually did, pre- <laughs> did pressing. This was done by treading on the grapes with bare feet. There was enough <laughs> pressure to extract the juice, but not enough to crush the grape pipes and release unpleasant bitterness. To avoid sippage, sippage? Slippage. Slipping. Slipping. The treaders would hold onto ropes attached to the roof. So you could see the winemaking process was much like we thought about like inside Lucy. ancient Greece. So really, it was. That's how it was. Um, Now, I'm going to continue just for a second here because this is really interesting. The Talmud describes six... Wait. 60 types. Hold on, Gumby. I'm not throwing any (laughs) punches. The Talmud describes 60 types of wines. Some wines were diluted with water. Others would invariably have flavored added to improve the taste and act as a preservative. Salt, seawater, herbs, and spices such as cinnamon were added. Raisins yep. or dates, honey, were used as sweeteners. Mm. These flavored wines were forerunners of the punches of vermouth of today. Mm-hmm. 
Smoked wine was cooked wine. They were the forerunners of merfusel wine, though it was done to concentrate the wine into a syrup rather than for kashrut reasons. Even those days, they knew about drying grapes on mats to concentrate the sweetness. This is similar to the vino santo produced today in Italy, or the similarly named vin santo produced in Greece. Or the ice wines that hmm. you get here in so, Lake Erie. Yeah, so what do you think of that? Kashrut reasons meaning kosher? Yes, yes, exactly. So, Manischewitz, obviously, David. Obviously, in, in Israel, we do have kosher wines. And so some of this did parlay into that. Yeah, and which even to this day, they don't let... Um, they wouldn't let us Gentiles into the room into making it. No. No. Because, yeah. you know, you can't have your Gentile feet on the Even if scrapes. my name was Jose. <laughs> <laughs> I won't let that go. <laughs> that was really great. <laughs> now, harvest time in Israel, the grapes began to ripen in August. Now, this is going to be key right here. I'm going to key in on this for a second here. Hold on one second. The grapes began to ripen in August, but the gathering in for making wine and molasses, dibs, and the storing of the dried figs and raisins is at the end of September. Between the barley harvest in April and the wheat harvest, only a few showers fall, which are welcome because they increase the yield of wheat. In Syria, the Christians still celebrate il ur rest uh, Feast of the Lord, at which time the owners of the vineyards bring their first bunches of grapes to the church, the children of Israel were enjoying or enjoined to the reap no harvest for which they had not labored. Mm. So, God save Syria. Once again, <laughs> you have the great Syrian Christians yes, sir. illustrating for us the fact that harvest time is when? In September. So if harvest time is in September, how throughout the rest of the year were they drinking, quote-unquote, grape juice, which churches like, you know, the Assemblies or the Church of God would have us believe they were drinking? Well, because they had Welch's. (laughs) Because if you go back and you look at when Jesus was drinking wine, it was not in September, which means Jesus was actually drinking wine. Mm -hmm. So if you actually coincide harvest time with the times that wine was being drunk, it was actual fermented wine. This is probably that's always their biggest argument. Right. In the previous year's Mm -hmm. harvest. And as you'll see in the in the coming slides, harvest time with only a three-day process for wine. Three-day process. So if you look at this, going into the next one, we're going to go into mixed wine. And this is actually out of... So, as some people know, I do like the New English translation. Um, it's not my favorite, but it is among my favorites because it includes like 65,000 notes among the Bible translation. Um, the term, I'm not going to pronounce it because it's in Hebrew, <laughs> does not refer to wine mixed with water to dilute its potency, but to strong drink mixed with weaker wine. Mm. This is key. Listen to this. The practice of mixing wine with water is not attested in the Hebrew Bible. Both, now mind you, this is a Hebrew word, and mesek, a Hebrew word, were referred to strong wine mixed with weaker wine. The, the rabbis later distinguished between the two, stating that, Hebrew word, <laughs> was strong wine mixed with weaker wine, while, Hebrew word, <laughs> was <laughs> wine mixed with water. That's later, later in the Testaments. However, both types of wine were intoxicating. Mixed wine was the most intoxicating type of wine. In a midrash on the book of Numbers, a comment is made about the practice of mixing strong wine with weaker wine, stating its purpose. They used to mix strong wine with weak wine so as to get drunk with it. That's in Numbers. 
the Mediterranean vocabulary of wine. The comparison of a wife's sexual love to intoxicating wine is common in ancient Near Eastern love literature. Parallel in thought are the words of the Hebrew sage, May your fountain be blessed, and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. A loving doe, a graceful deer, may her love or breasts always enjoy <laughs> intoxicating you. May you ever stagger like a drunkard in her love. Are you sure that's Aww. Proverbs and that Song of Solomon? Or? It's Proverbs 5, 18 through 19. It's romantic. Absolutely. It really is. Yeah. It's romantic. It refers to mixed wine. I think I've read that in a Hallmark card before. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, so you answered my question. I mean, there definitely was awareness as to control that process, mm -hmm. as to what was stronger and which wasn't. Exactly. So you had wine, and wine could be brewed strong or weak, but mixed wine was often strong wine. Because it was mixed with weaker wines, which makes it like an intermediary wine. Mm -hmm. I guess kind of like a rosé, right? Or a Shiraz. Yeah. <laughs> and again, moderation was still essential for both because yes. the end result could still be, mm. you could still be well, drunk. I mean, that goes back to like your, what, your, your Psalms 31, right? It doesn't say that, wrong, that, that, that it's wrong, but it says that the strong drink may be wrong for a king because he is executing commands, rules, and laws. And he needs to have a clearer mind. Right. Mm. So, Ample evidence is available to demonstrate that wine, though always fermented, always fermented, was usually mixed with water in the classical and Hellenistic world. Now, for those not aware, the Hellenistic world is the, the Greek. Greek world. So now you're talking about, say, Babylonia, and then going into the Roman world. Okay. So, the wine was stored in large jugs called amphorae, from which the wine was poured through a strainer into a large mixing bowl called a crater. In the crater, the wine was mixed with water. Then the drinking bowls or cups were filled. The amount of wine per volume varied. The mixture that represented the greatest amount of water to wine was 20 to 1. Now, that was the greatest Okay, that was not standard. So the greatest variance of that was a 20 to 1. That was if you absolutely had to work all day long <laughs> and you didn't want to be intoxicated, it was a 20 to 1 ratio. Apparently, now mind you, once again, it harkens back to nobody drank pure water. Why? Because there's this stuff, stuff called bacteria. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So to, and <laughs> right. So to purify the water, you had to intoxicate it. Yeah. You yeah. had to use actual alcohol inside the water. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you'd think back, they didn't have clear containers, so you would never know what's inside your vessels. Right. And darkness and warmth, which exists in that terrain, you know, would definitely promote lots of bacterial growth. Right. So, once again, you had to add alcohol to the wine, or to the water, rather, just to clean it. So, um, to went back in, uh, because the wine was so strong, and that's from Homer's Odyssey. Um, in the waters Mediterranean world, the term wine referred to the mixture of wine and water. If one desired to mention wine without water, it was necessary to add the word unmixed. For the Greeks to drink wine unmixed was regarded as barbaric. The evidence, however, seems to indicate that in the Old Testament, wine was used without being mixed with water. The terminology of mixing water and wine is striking, strikingly unattested. Wine diluted with water was symbolic of spiritual adulteration. Whoa. So, literally... If you were drinking water with your wine, it was symbolic of adultery. What? Yeah. That is attested throughout the Old Testament. <laughs> wow. And that's, that's reflected inside Isaiah, or Isaiah, 122. By, Romans, by Roman times, this attitude changed. 
the Mishnah assumes a ratio of two parts of water to one part wine. However, later Talmudic sources speak of three to one. So you're still talking about only a one-third dilution, even in later times. Any, any, any thoughts on that? I think I'm just amazed that, that they really had such a, uh, really just such a grip on how strong they needed it to be. Right. And, you know, that, that, that's fascinating to me. Yeah. So uh, to continue, the strength of ancient wine is somewhat of a puzzle. A natural, non-distilled wine could reach as high as 15% alcohol content. If watered down three parts water to one part wine, the alcohol content would be 5% and still fairly potent. Think about it. Yeah. Mike? 6%. How? That's right. <laughs> yeah. our, our content tonight is 6%, right? You got it. So do you feel pretty good? I feel like, yeah, I wouldn't want to go much higher than this. Right. Than standard drinking. If, I'm, if I can't drink water and I have to drink this all day... Yeah, I'm going to be slurring quite a bit. Right. <laughs> by and by yet, 10 a.m. <laughs> yeah, in the ancient world, this is the highest illusion. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I can't <laughs> so, well, so they probably didn't have couches back then, because if they did, I'd be yeah. like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Just find a rock to lay on. Right. <laughs> took a lot of naps. <laughs> <laughs> so, once again, the difficulty arises in trying to understand how any naturally fermented wine could be so strong as much as 20 parts of water were added to one part of wine. Now think about that. That means that the strong wine was probably like our vodka yeah. or our rum or our whiskey, right? If, I mean, it's kind of funny because it does say that those didn't come around until later. And yet the alcohol content, when taken in contrast with what's written, must have been much higher than standard wine. Yeah. So I guess that kind of makes sense. I mean, considering how far our technology has uh, progressed now that they right. didn't have. <laughs> In addition, Pliny, and Pliny was a, a very early um, scholar, Pliny speaks of fermenting wine having such a high alcohol content that it could burn. Laboratory experimentation demonstrate that mixtures containing less than 30% of alcohol will not burn instantly. It will burn if a flame is applied persistently at room temperature. So think about that. So if the wine is so strong, they can burn. Mm -hmm. You're talking about a very high alcohol, yeah, alcohol that's content. That's stuff, yeah. <laughs> that's Mike's moonshine. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> moonshine. You know, some good bourbon, I mean, you can tell just by sniffing it. If it burns on the way up, it's going to burn on the way down. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. How do you I feel about that, Mike? It. We don't condone it. It's pretty impressive, that's for sure. <laughs> but I don't know, at that point, going to be your previous point of, like, lowering the ABV. I don't think that's what they meant because no, everything was such high ABV. Sort of I mean, yeah, it, yeah. some of it was. So once again, it depends on the age of the wine, because what? If well, that's you, not if what Paul meant. Right. 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 Yeah. If you if you go back to but the there Furman, was a weirdness to them. Yes, it's pretty impressive that they knew. You know, that's they. What I was yeah, I mean, hey, that. mix twenty to one. Jeez, drives me crazy to do that. In my snowblower. I do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, because like Aaron's saying. Is that you know, when you mix the oil well, with the yeah, gas? You, well, yeah, you're not really strong enough to handle this yet. But since we can't drink straight water because we'll yeah. die, right? You have to have this this much yeah, this alcohol. Ratio. In. Right. So it's impressive. So, so think about it. How often do they have to experiment to get to that? Were they dropping worms inside there to see how fast they died? <laughs> how fast they got drunk? Wait, wait. We need. We need more worms. We need more worms. So dump this one in. No, 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 no. It took way too long for him to die. <laughs> took him five bad. seconds right. to start stumbling. <laughs> so you dip them in and pull them out. See how they just crawl. <laughs> right, right. So how did they come up with that ratio? It's kind of it's kind of fascinating if you think about it yeah. because they didn't have microscopes and they didn't have like you know all of our modern medicine and 
Makes you wonder. Ivan, come here. Drink this. <laughs> <laughs> why, why, did Bri- why did Aaron do a Russian accent and you pick a Russian name? <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> was the New Testament ris- written up there? I if it was knew Spanish that. one, you can call me Jose. <laughs> <laughs> so this next part's interesting for all of you mixologists out there like me. <laughs> um, Wine was mixed not only with water, but with other ingredients, similar to mixed drinks today. An example of this is seen in the Homeri, or Homeric, that's Homer, the author, if you go back to like the Odyssey and the Iliad, um, hymn to Demeter, where the goddess rejects straight wine and desires the drink mixed with meal, water, and a soft mint. Often strong wine was into was mixed into weak wine, resulting in a stronger drink. This is what meant by mixture in the Bible. Psalm seventy five eight, Isaiah five twenty two, Liqueur. Revelation eighteen six, and nineteen thirteen through fifteen. At times, the refreshed wine, high in sugar content, was evaporated, and this concentrate. What must was mixed with wine to obtain a higher alcohol content. Of the core. Mm. So it's interesting that what we had back then, we have now. Mm-hmm. So like, were they making like Bahama Mamas and stuff back then? <laughs> <laughs> but they keep saying how they mix the stronger wine with the weaker wine mm-hmm. to make it stronger. But at that point, the Stronger wine must have been just too strong to drink in the first place because you had to bring it down a little bit. Yeah. I mean, your stronger wine was yeah. probably strong <laughs> wine. <laughs> I mean, how else can you explain Moonshine. mixing it 20 yeah. to 1, right? Yeah. So, I mean, think about it. If you took standard wine, and your standard wine's below 14%. Let's say your standard wine is like 10%. If you put that 20 to 1, it, it's nothing. I mean, you, yeah. you, you're you're likely not even to taste the wine itself mm-hmm. at that per, at that time, you know, right? So, I mean, in order for you to actually get the flavor of the wine or to kill anything inside the water, you have to have at least what probably a forty proof, right? With all this new information, that really makes the first miracle uh, really makes you rethink it in a, in a different kind of way. Yeah. You know, if it was just water, nasty water, right? Fluoridated water. Um, <laughs> well, they, they weren't fluoridating the water back then. <laughs> what we do now. They just went and dipped it in a river, you know. <laughs> but it really makes you, you know, think about that. Like, wow. I mean, like, yeah. Yeah, they knew their want. You know, they yeah. they knew the ABVs, so yeah. they said you yeah. saved the yeah. best for last. That was so part was of a- Jesus's culture. You're yeah. you're right. Yeah, I mean. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it's safe to say the at this point the feast was that back on us. <laughs> it's safe to say at this point that every iteration of the word wine, Greek or Hebrew, did refer to fermented wine. But what did to Gumby to expand what Gumby was saying, and you may have meant this, is every inference of water actually wine yes. laced water. Yes, because if you go back to what I just read, that is actually out of the Baker Encyclopedia of the Bible. Those links will be posted. (laughs) And out of Baker's Encyclopedia of the Water, it specifically states that any any mention of water inside the Old Testament or New Testament must state that it is unmixed. Gotcha. Wait, what? (laughs) <laughs> so um, what does that do for the first miracle? <laughs> it was already that means yeah. that it was alcoholic wine. So is it more like, man, what are you guys doing with this? This isn't wine. You need to mix this right. <laughs> is that how the miracle went? You know, in my mind, I'm thinking he had some Aquafina bottles, and they're like, <laughs> yeah, this is not. This is just water. So wait, you're showing right. partiality. You prefer Aquafina to Decina. <laughs> <laughs> Well, whatever. Pick your poison. <laughs> I'm with you. I'm thinking you put like a pitcher of water out on every table. Just a lot of mine. Table. <laughs> just a lot of, but it's not actually water. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
I like Deer Park. Deer Park's really good water. So what you're saying is all, it was already some type. It, it could have been already some type of wine. The equivalent of chlorinated water. <laughs> <laughs> but using water. No, wait. No, no, wait. Except with wine. Chlorinated sort of water. Now we're bringing a completely new element to this. <laughs> oh, are we? No, I think, I mean, they basically substitute chlorine with wine, it sounds like. Yeah. Do you know you can only smell chlorination after you've peed in it? Oh. I didn't know that. I'll have to show you later. Oh, what? No. Really <laughs> I think we're digressing a little bit here, guys. It's <laughs> really interesting. It's very, very interesting. It's actually called trichloride at that point. We are it's really interesting. Rated R. <laughs> yeah. We have jumped over Okay, so back to this. Yeah. I guess right, what I'm right. asking is, like, was the water, quote, unquote, already some type of wine? Yes. So to clear this up. Wow. According to Baker Encyclopedia. Up, evangelicals. Did you hear that? <laughs> According to Baker Encyclopedia of the Bible, unless it specifically states unmixed, it includes an element of fermented wine. But probably not enough to get you drunk. I mean, it, in, in our state today, it would be like a, uh, like, like a Bud Light. A okay. three-two <laughs> three beer. So the, yeah, all right. So that, that makes me ask this. Why wouldn't they just state... Jesus turned the bad wine into really good wine. <laughs> Ooh, well put, well put. Well, now mind you, okay, Is that so... that lesson the miracle? Now, that, now this, where I'm going. this actually takes us into a whole new topic because the water he used was not supposed to be used for the actual marriage, mm, wedding, okay. okay, the ceremony. It was gotcha. not supposed to be used for the wedding. So the water he used was actually supposed to be used for a ceremony which involved the red heifer, which was supposed to go into a whole different ceremony. So okay. we can cover that in a different topic because this, oh. uh, this is actually pre pretty extensive. So that was actually ceremonial water that was being used. And a ceremonial water, believe it or not, had the ashes of a red heifer sprinkled inside of it. Mm. So. And wine? <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> not until <laughs> Jesus said. <laughs> That's All right. heifer wine. So we do not know if it was Fermented actually... Fermented red heifer ashes. <laughs> right. I mean, think about it. If it's ceremonial wine, you wouldn't you wouldn't be adding the wine to begin Stop with. Stop it, right. Mike. Okay. My mind is already so. rocked by the whole thing. <laughs> no, that was good clarification because I was with you where I was like, well, you know, but, I mean, you're feeding your baby this water you have to know the difference you wouldn't say yeah. get some wine for my baby you'd probably say get some water for my baby but you would know it's sanitized water yeah that, I guess yeah. that really makes you think about a lot of things yeah. right yeah yeah so but it was it was ceremonial water being used for a festival and it was ashes of a red heifer that were sprinkled into that water. It's very interesting. We should do that topic because I really want to understand where you're getting that from. We should. I didn't read that. You know what we'll Bible. do is we'll cover that when we go over laws in Leviticus. That is on our topics. So we'll go over laws of Leviticus and red heifer, the ashes of the red heifer, are actually brought up in that. So no one asks for a pitcher of water at a wedding in Jerusalem. Back then. Only if you really want diarrhea. <laughs> <Gotcha>. <laughs> But pretty interesting. Uh, I'm going to finish it off right here with this paragraph right here. The strong drink of the Old Testament seems to be closely related to Mesopotamian date wine. This date wine, high in sugar content, must have also been high in alcohol content. One Hebrew word is consistently used as strong drink. Uh, these links we posted. There is an equivalent word to this in Ugaritic translated drink which parallels the normal word for the wine strong drink is usually condemned and is especially forbidden to priests on duty it is commented for the weak and weary proverbs 31 6 so strong drink i won't try to pronounce it <laughs> strong drink is actually okay for poor you know, like us blue collar guys, all right? Mm -hmm. But it's not recommended for kings who must institute law because they're over other people where they must rule them. So mm -hmm. it actually states that right inside. If you read through like your Psalms and stuff like that, your Proverbs, 
strong drink is not to be used by kings or supervisors <laughs> who must mandate uh, law. Mike's trying, to, Mike's trying to catch me, and I catch 22 here. I did here. catch you. <laughs> <laughs> did, the, did the kings get the heifer water? <laughs> this is not strong drink, Mike. <laughs> okay. Touche. <Yeah. laughs> it's okay for the blue-collar people who must, quote-unquote, forget their woes. And that's actually echoed across the wow. Psalms, especially places like Psalm 31. For hmm. the normal people who forget they're paying taxes, they're doing all the work, and exactly. they just do the same thing when they wake up the next morning. <laughs> yeah, I got you. Yeah. yeah. Your blue collar worker. Yeah. Yeah. So, fairly interesting. Mm. It is interesting. Yeah. Did you interject the forget the woes part, though? No, that is actually <laughs> in Psalm 21, if you go to Psalm 21. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, 31. Psalm 31. So, your earlier point of, you know, people a lot of times use alcohol as a tool to forget your woes. Yeah. Is necessarily, I mean, it's kind of a biblical philosophy. Yeah. But, again, not condoning it. <laughs> it's no. just... Yeah, it's it's it it does reflect that, and it's kind of funny because the first several verses in Psalm in Psalm thirty one reflect a king's behavior, and the rest of Psalm thirty one talks about the way your wife is supposed to be, and luckily my wife reflects perfectly what Psalm thirty one is supposed to be because she is the perfect wife. I'm not saying that she actually is; she's just amazing. Over For here. you, she's perfect. She, she really she's is. within punching distance. I, so I, I, I mean, this. <laughs> yeah, my wife of mine over here. I couldn't imagine a more perfect wife than the one that sits next to me over here. She but it's uh, well. she does. She really does. She fills in all of my weaknesses. If I had a piano, I'd play some music for you. Right now. <laughs> I'd appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> but the um, but it, it does reflect a blue collar man's woes because. You know, if you look at a king's life, he has everything, right? He has a he has multiple wives, he has a harem, he has a kingdom, he has the blue collar guys who are doing all of his work, but that's also why he's not supposed to drink the strong drink. Because he's the one who has to be fair and tell all those blue collar guys what they're supposed to do with a clear head, as opposed to the blue collar guys who are actually doing the work. <laughs> and they're the ones who have to go home sore and tired and make their wives happy and teach their children and do all of this. Mm. So there is a reflection of your status. My, my. Uh, across never the Psalms. <laughs> right. You know, status is across the Psalms and the Proverbs. Yeah. So. I'm still not over the first miracle. <laughs> <laughs> The first what miracle is, is amazing. I'm really rethinking so that. Psalm 31, which I, verse? And, uh, Psalm 31. It's actually the first, I think it's the first eight psalms talk about um, a, a king's status and the way he's supposed to behave. And the rest of it, I could be wrong, but I believe it's the first eight psalms that talk about, uh, about a king and his behavior. And I believe after that, everything else has to do with the wife. Um, but, at going back, <laughs> all right, I've been told I shouldn't say but. However, <laughs> echoing back, um, we, we should, like the Psalms say, enjoy our wines, but we should be reflective and praising our Creator mm. while we are enjoying those wines. Yes. We should have accurate behavior to what we believe. We should be taking, okay, kind of like the Eastern Orthodox do. Okay, if you look at the Eastern Orthodox, they... They drink their wines and their beers while praising the Creator. It's not separate. It's not something you do on weekends and then you go to church. It's actually part of the celebration. Yeah. You celebrate your Creator. You celebrate your family. You celebrate the body of Christ. It's all inclusive. And that's the way it's supposed to be. It shouldn't be separate. Your, your life is supposed to be reflected as the body of Christ. Your life is supposed to be reflected with your neighbors and your creator and all of creation. All of it should be inclusive. None of it should be separated. So that's the way that I believe it should be. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Any objections? Moderation. No, actually, you have me in prayer right now, thanking the Lord 
for this evening in our <laughs> fellowship that we have hit here, that we have here, in uh, in sharing of, of uh, our tastings that we do, um, in the camaraderie that we have together, in the oneness of Christ that we have together, in discussing what we talk about and what we um, that we just uh, volley around different ideas and various things uh, that we speak about in, in terms of, uh, although the, the alcohol isn't the, the emphasis, but is the, um, is the goodness of, of God's creation that we, we drink of. Yeah, I agree. And that we, 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 we give him glory for in, 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 the, in, the, in the, the bondness that, he's, that he has between us. And like even as you have between your wife and I have with my wife and you guys have with your wives, that we have that that's 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 the goodness of God that He gives to us. Yeah. I agree. So once again, Good we're point. not we're not condemning Western evangelicals like your Church of God and your assemblies and your Baptists and your we're not condemning them, but we are saying that they do need to actually learn scripture in context. And yes, I am actually going on a limb, and I will say that. I will say that for every Atta person boy, thinking it. <laughs> because <laughs> You're saying what a lot of guys are thinking. Yes. Yeah. Because let's face but it. But I'm okay with you saying it. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of your assemblies and, and, and your Pentecostals and your Charismatics, um, they're doing it in secret. They're having a beer in secret. They're having a wine in secret. Why? Oh. It's wrong. When God himself has created the process to make this happen. In fact, it cre- without us ever stepping in, it happens in nature. We shouldn't be prohibiting it. We should be teaching people how to use it responsibly, using it in church functions, using it in family functions responsibly, in a way that celebrates the Creator, celebrates community, and celebrates the body of Christ. So... I will step in here in opposition to what a lot of the Western branches teach and say that we do need to do things responsibly and in everything in moderation. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I I, I think it backfires. Even if you look at, like, prohibition, once, you know, even if government tries to step in and they try to regulate it, it just backfires. Great point. Every time. Great no point. What, whatever the substance is, it seems to backfire. It becomes right. more and more uh, of a problem. It goes back to, to children. If you tell your children, just walk around and say, don't do that. Well, they're going to secretly walk around behind your back yeah. and try to do it. If you teach them the right way to do it, then they become more responsible with it. Exactly. Right. It's not so mystic anymore. Right. Yeah. I think on this topic, you know, it, there's probably a good amount of listeners that want to interject a thought or would like to participate, and we have avenues for that on BibleOverBrews.com and Facebook, so definitely uh, we'd love to hear some opinions. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Except from assemblies. <laughs> <laughs> joking, no, you're allowed to. So. <laughs> Bring them on. We, we would love we, to hear your we, comments as we, well. We accept feedback from any denomination. <laughs> <laughs> We All may not listen to it, but Good we will <laughs> accept it. <laughs> so um, we will end the segment there. So if you want to reach out to us, don't forget to reach us on BibleOverBrews.com, on Facebook, on Twitter, 